We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Yeah, it was, Mark, it was phenomenal. It's, uh, no matter how many times I, I watch the launch, it, it, uh, it never gets old. The butterflies in your stomach, the, uh, you know, it, it's just a phenomenal feeling. Griffin, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Join me, Mark Hannaford the founder of Wide Extreme Medicine, as I speak this weekend to J.D. Polk, the Chief Medical Officer for NASA, about the recent Dragon Mort being the world's top space medic and the future of space exploration. Hey, that's one of the better sims, believe me. Pleasure, as always, to be able to, to speak to you, and especially when it's so close after the, the amazing success of the Dragon launch. For the first time that American astronauts have left American soil since the end of the shuttle, Special program. Um, how did how did that feel? It, it was sensational, Mark. It um, it was good being back in the launch control center, as you mentioned. You know, I've not been there in nine years, and uh, and it uh, it's like it just happened yesterday. Uh, but to see uh, that vehicle, uh, the the ride uh, looked really smooth as far as uh, you know the vibration and oscillation. Uh, the astronauts and their families, uh, you know, and, and you know, seeing Doug and Bob and their their families and folks and getting ready for that launch, the excitement behind the launch, all of it just phenomenal. Um, and then, uh, you know, the vehicle performed flawlessly, as did the crew. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better launch and docking. And JD, you're um, the chief medical officer for Vanessa. Tell us a little bit about your journey to being in. That remarkable position. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's tough being the chief now because I, you know, huh. you always want to do the the stuff, the exciting stuff that all your troops are doing now. Um, uh, but now, you know, I'm supposed to be the uh, lofty uh, A-suite uh, guy doing the executive functions and just oversight. But uh, you know, I, I came up uh, through the space program actually uh, as one of the rescue forces, uh, what we call air docs, and the air docs are the uh, doctors on the helicopters and the search and rescue helicopters that would uh, rescue the astronauts in the event of a contingency, and that's. That's really where I got my start and then uh, worked my way up almost uh, literally through every position uh, that they had in medical at, at NASA as, the, uh, as a, the rank and file flight surgeon going back and forth to Russia, uh, to the chief of medical operations, to the chief of the space medicine division, to the deputy chief medical officer of Johnson Space Center. Uh, took a short hiatus to, uh, to do some other things like be a dean of a medical school and then uh, came back to NASA. NASA and uh, became the uh, chief health and medical officer. And it's, it's great, but it's also, uh, I got to tell you, all the young flight surgeons, it, it's like things keep getting better. Version 2.0 and 3.0 of a flight surgeon gets better and smarter. And uh, these folks are just tremendous. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of humbling to be at the top of that uh, team because they are just a great group of folks. And the Dragon launch in, in many respects, and ushered in a new dawn of space exploration and space travel. It, you know, it's, it was a remarkable historic moment and, you know, apt that it went from American soul. How many missions have you actually covered off in terms of the launch? Oh, golly. In terms of, uh, you know, between space shuttle launches, Soyuz launches, uh, being the um, rescue surgeon for five different launches and landings and, uh, um, all, all together, prob I think this was my 25th uh, between all of the uh, space shuttle Soyuz uh, in, in different functions, whether it was the MMT surgeon or the uh, flight surgeon or the rescue surgeon or some uh, way or form. I've been associated with close to 25 launches, uh, which is uh, which makes me feel old. Uh, you know, Mark, I tell you, you know, there. Uh, we were just looking at uh, Kate Rubens, uh, just who's one of the astronauts. She's also a physician, a great researcher. Uh, she's going back up to the International Space Station, and I'm looking at that expedition, and I think uh, hers will be uh, Expedition 65 uh, to the space station. And uh, you know, my uh, first mission that where I was assigned as a flight surgeon. 
uh, to the, the International Space Station was Expedition 6. Uh, so, you know, I'm a single digit guy. I, I, I knew those missions and, and now we're up into the 60s and close to 70s on the space station. And it's, uh, it's amazing that that has been inhabited now for uh, continuously for 20 years. And that's, uh, that's just an amazing thing to me. I mean, uh, somebody who's 19 years old right now uh, has never known a time where humans did not live off the Earth. Uh, and that's, that's kind of an odd thing to get your head wrapped around. Did the Dragon launch to you? And I know NASA is a family, so you're, you know, you're, of course, every launch is important, absolutely. But did the Dragon launch feel different in a way that it was dawning in a new era? It, it does because this is the ushering in of commercial spaceflight. This is the first time where this was not our specific rocket. We we developed the standards and the requirements and gave those to SpaceX, and they, they built the vehicle based on our standards and requirements, but we gave them great freedom and how they implemented those or how they designed them and uh, instead of doing it quote unquote the NASA way and they were very innovative and came up with lots of different solutions uh, that were uh, different than what we would have done um, and they've been very innovative in that respect I think we've taught them some things on systems integration and and engineering and and, and human physiology in space I think they've taught us some things on how to be more nimble uh, how to think about solution sets in a different way. Uh, but the real thing, Mark, is, is we're almost to a tipping point now. And I think this is what creates that tipping point where, you know, before space was a unique thing where only unique astronauts got to fly courtesy of a government. And it's tipping over into where commercial entities will be able to fly people. Uh, if you think about the aviation industry, where at the turn of the century, you know, at the last century, only military aviators uh, sponsored by a government flew. And now you and I fly and, you know, don't think anything about it. And we're watching Netflix at 30,000 feet. And, and you know, it's moving to that era to where space becomes not so much of a niche for a select group, but maybe something attainable for all of us. And that's, that is uh, an interesting flow and tipping point for society, I think. And has the collaboration between NASA and the private sector really been the, the catalyst for that um, acceleration? I think so. And, and you know, the, the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA on our side, uh, oversees commercial spaceflight. NASA is not a, uh, an oversight agency uh, in that respect. So we don't set the regulations uh, for these companies. Uh, you know, we will set the requirements and standards for vehicles that we're building or sponsoring. But uh, someone else is actually going to regulate that industry. And, and it's, uh, it's interesting to see as it evolves and takes off. It's, uh, but NASA has certainly been the one that uh, has started this, uh, you know, over a decade ago. And uh, I think it really started with the space tourists going up to the space station and evolved and, uh, and trying to get lighter and leaner and doing things uh, more economically. Uh, it's really just been an evolution over the last decade. And some people, and I think right, rightly so, would, would make comments that um, with some environmental concerns here on Earth, whether exploring space is an appropriate thing to do. Yeah, and, you know, it's, it, that's, that's one discussion, discussion I think we, we need to do better at is the marketing of what does spaceflight do for Earth? Um, and there's so many things. Um, Mark, just like a, a year or so ago when we had the Zika outbreak, uh, you know, with the, uh, we were able to look with our aqua satellites to figure out where uh, the most likely breeding grounds were for those mosquitoes based on the water saturation and the soil and the environment. Uh, there are things that space brings to the table um, that helps and benefits humankind on Earth that folks just don't really you know, even imagine. I mean, even small things like what you and I use all the time in the clinic, the, the temperature-taking uh, probe that you would stick in a child's ear, uh, that uh, thermo thermographic technology came from NASA and from spaceflight to, to be able to tell what a planet, uh, how hot or warm a planet was on a satellite. And then uh, that same technology was turned into temperature probes in medicine. But 
most of those things don't ever have a little label on them uh, that says, you know, invented by the space program or came from space technology. Uh, but there are t many, many, many things uh, that benefit Earth. Uh, the things that we're doing on the International Space Station right now as an international lab uh, are are really inspiring. The, the work on the Parkinson's disease, uh, work on vaccinations, uh, work on stem cells, uh, all going on on orbit, uh, because microgravity allows a three-dimensional view of, of something that normally we squish on a slide in two dimensions, um, and also allows uh, different proteins and lattice structures to occur because of the lack of gravity, um, which could you know, revolutionize certain areas in pharmaceuticals and other places. So it, it really does come home to earth, but um, you know, marketing that and letting folks know, it's probably something we, we need to continue to do. You mentioned the air Is that the same technology that's being used in the detection of COVID-19? Yes, some of the technologies that we're using right now, they, they're offshoots. Of course, each time people develop and they improve upon certain technologies and they miniaturize it. But yes, some of the exact thermographic scanning that we use for planets is exactly the same type of technology that we're using for COVID-19 right now. And, and as you know, uh, you know, uh, our folks developed a ventilator specifically for COVID patients um, in a rapid amount of time, uh, you know, literally 69 days from start to finish uh, for a prototype and to get it certified by the uh, Food and Drug Administration here in the U.S. Um, they've got about uh, 25 prototypes now and, and just did the licensing agreements to uh, companies both in the U.S. and internationally, especially in the southern hemisphere, to try to help those folks. Uh, you know, many of the countries in Africa, as you and I both know, uh, might have four ventilators for you know, a million people. Uh, and so I think that technology and making it small, light, lean, e economical, and easily produced uh, is really important. And a lot of those things keep coming from the space program. Do you have a contingency plan for one of the astronauts in the space station having COVID? Uh, you know, if somebody were happened to test positive or if we accidentally brought it up, oh, absolutely we do. Um, uh, the first thing we do is, is we are, um, you know, really, really tight on what we call our, our uh, HSP, our health stabilization program, which is, you know, the astronauts, uh, before COVID came along, the astronauts still went into quarantine for 14 days prior to a mission on a nominal mission, just because we didn't want a cold to get up on, on orbit. You know, it's hard to do a spacewalk and clear your ears and your helmet if your head's all stuffed up and you got a cold and snot's running down your face or floating up your face. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we, we just, we don't want normal things getting up. Um, think, and when we do a lot of testing, think like H. pylori, which you and I know for stomach ulcers, uh, you know, and we have a breath test for H. pylori. But when you're on orbit, that H. pylori that you might exhale or if you cough is now floating. Uh, and you could give that H. pylori to another astronaut. Um, and cause them stomach ulcers. So we, we even test for things like H. pylori and eradicate that before they fly. We, we do a huge amount of preventive medicine before someone gets up. And we, we did have contingency protocols that in case, uh, because this virus has an R0 of three and, and, uh, and you know, can transmit through fomites and all sorts of things, we did have a lot of contingency plans um, that were certain gates that if somebody became symptomatic, we wouldn't open the hatch or if somebody uh, you know developed symptoms here this is what we would do uh, but yes we've we've had those contingencies plans uh, but really they're probably in the safest place right now they're not exposed to anybody else uh, uh, you know the best place to be is not on earth right now probably uh, as far as an infectious disease standpoint indeed absolutely right what um and, and COVID aside what is the emergency evacuation plan for an astronaut who's injured in the International Space Station and getting them back to Earth. Yeah, you know, we always have what's called uh, an emergency vehicle on board. So when uh, the reason that uh, we don't have astronauts on the space station if there's not a Soyuz, if there's not a SpaceX vehicle, if there's not some other vehicle attached, um, 
is because we need to have a quote unquote lifeboat in case there is some, you know, a fire. Uh, if there was a, a space debris, a micrometeoroid that, that smashes into the space station and causes a decompression. We, there's a host of different things that could happen in space aside from an astronaut getting sick or injured uh, that would cause us to potentially evacuate. And we have had times where we've had the astronauts go to the Soyuz and sit there because there was, you know, uh, micrometeoroid debris uh, in the area, uh, or uh, there were other systems. And we, we do that check out um, almost uh, every mission. Uh, yeah, even this SpaceX crew uh, is going on the timeline, has a period where they will look at that SpaceX vehicle as a lifeboat and will practice getting in that vehicle if there was a contingency. Uh, so that, that vehicle is always there. Um, as a lifeboat, the hard part is timing. As as you know, you know when we come over uh, Earth and land masses, etc. If we want to land in water, uh, as we do with the SpaceX vehicle, uh, but in land with the Soyuz vehicle, we have to time that uh, as to when we will dock uh, or undock, and then do our our uh, retrograde burn to enter the atmosphere to target where we're going to land. Um, so there's a lot of things that need to line up for that. And, and uh, we have multiple contingency landing sites throughout the world uh, that are, are kept and on the database for the flight directors so that it, at any one time, if something happens on the space station, they know where the next contingency landing site is going to be and where the crew, if they had to do an emergency evacuation, would end up. The Dragon capsule and the way the astronauts are dressed, and I want to ask you about that in a minute, has leaped on. Everything is so much more modern. It, it looks more space. But one of the things that's going to look very historic is that landing back on Earth into the water, which will trigger all those sort of um, childhood memories for us of you know, the Apollo cap capsules coming back in. Um, that also would, you know, harks back to the reignition of the desire to land on the moon. And is the SpaceX vehicle a key step in that in that ambition? I, I think commercial spaceflight in general is a key step in that ambition because um, the difficult part for NASA is we can't do all things for all people all the time. And so what I mean by that is. Um, we want to keep our International Space Station mission going because of the outstanding science on board and it's and all the countries that are working together on that. It's a definitely a world international platform. Uh, but if we we're constantly building the vehicles uh, to uh, and NASA alone building those vehicles for commercial flight to get up and down to the space station, that takes our concentration away from doing exploration in the moon, Mars, et cetera. Um, and so really what we're evolving to is turning over the transportation to and from the space station to the commercial sector, to SpaceX, to Boeing, um, and have those commercial vendors, uh, you know, bring people back and forth to the space station. And, and we're even about to do something even more novel, which is look at putting a module on the space station that is not NASA's. Uh, or one of our international partners, but that would literally be a commercial module, uh, you know, is coming onto the side. And, uh, you know, that could be a pharmaceutical company, that could be an aerospace company uh, who leases things out, but it, it turns a lot of that over to the commercial sector so that NASA is focusing on things like the moon and Mars again. Uh, for our own builds, you know, for our own capsule. The Orion program uh, is, you know, that is our capsule that will take us uh, to the Gateway. And then, of course, Gateway and Artemis, that program, getting us back to the moon. Uh, and it allows us to do that. What sort of time frames are we, we talking about for that, JD, for the moon and then onwards to Mars? You know, it's it's an incredibly fast timeline. Uh, initially, we were looking at, at uh, eight to ten years, and then uh, this administration said, um, "Let's do that in four. And so uh, we are we are going at breakneck speed, but not. Um, I would say not recklessly. You know, it, it is, we have shortened uh, the the cycle for decision velocity to, to make decisions and, and nail down 
systems and engineering. Uh, but part of the advantage of working with the commercial partners is we've learned from them probably how to be a little bit more nimble. Uh, and that has allowed us to accelerate our timeline, I think, for the moon. Uh, so we're still targeting 2024, whether that, you know, yeah, you, there are certain things that come into play like worldwide pandemics that we didn't plan for and, uh, and hurricanes. We've got a, you know, a hurricane staring down at the Stennis Space Center right now or, or Stennis uh, where we're doing important work on the, what we call the B2 test stand for our next vehicle. And so you're, those are the risks that always play into the calendar, uh, you know, but we're targeting 2024 and we're, we are moving at a just phenomenal speed for a government agency. That's a that's a remarkably ambitious target, isn't it? But I think it's a, as you said, it's a collaboration with the private sector, which is providing, yeah. excusing the pun, the rocket fuel for the whole process. And and Mars is an interesting concept of when that will occur. Part of it is you need the political and public will. You know, you you, you got to. Yeah, there's the old saying, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. Uh, you know, if, unless you've got the funding behind you and, and, and Congress uh, and the White House behind you, uh, it's, it's hard to embark on that program. Uh, timing wise, you'd like to do that in what's called uh, solar max, uh, which sounds, it sounds kind of the opposite of what you'd want to do. You'd think when the sun was really active, you wouldn't want to go uh, to Mars because of the radiation. But the, the solar radiation interferes with the cosmic galactic radiation. Or the, I probably said that backwards, galactic cosmic radiation, GCR. Um, you know, think of it as these lower energy particles, but a lot of them uh, interfere with these high energy particles coming through space. And uh, uh, whereas solar radiation, if there's a coronal mass ejection in an event, uh, you're worried about acute radiation sickness, uh, the galactic cosmic radiation uh, is, that's one that you can't really stop uh, with a vehicle or with, uh, you know, different countermeasures, and it's going to go through the vehicle and through the person. And those are the things we worry about for long-term risk like cancer. Um, so we have both of those that we take into account, but uh, uh, you know, trying to shoot probably in the 2030s uh, for when that solar cycle occurs uh, is when we'd want to do opt optimally the Mars mission. And you and you got to wait till Mars is close to Earth, So, um, which, you know, Ideally, that would be when you have a six-month transit right now to, to Mars. And then you have to wait for Mars to come back around uh, unless you want to have a long uh, Venus flyby uh, coming back. Solar radiation must be one of the biggest concerns in terms of human health, aside from the obvious space travel. How, how do you mitigate for that on such a long journey? Yeah, and it's there's several things. One of the best ways to mitigate it uh, has nothing to do with medicine. One of the best ways to mitigate it is actually to increase the speed in transit when you are doing interplanetary transit. So the engine guys uh, are really important for that. Uh, when you think of it as time, distance, and shielding, uh, if I can decrease the amount of time that the astronauts are exposed, uh, then that's very helpful. And so if, if we develop new engine technologies that shorten that trip from six months to four months, you know, that gives me a, a large percentage decrease in their cancer risk. Um, that's one way. Um, obviously, shielding is another thing that we look at and, and uh, what we call passive shielding and active shielding. Passive shielding is, is when we put something uh, in a vehicle to try to absorb that uh, radiation. Uh, hydrogen is a very good absorber of uh, you know, radioactive particles. Uh, so whether we put something that has a, a large amount of hydrogen into the walls or, or areas there, um, that's another thing to think about. And then, of course, making sure that the human uh, optimizing their health, whether that's through uh, pharmaceuticals or diet or a combination of all sorts of things, uh, so that they can repair free radicals and, uh, and repair any hits uh, that they take from a radiation particle. So those are typically the, the three things that we think about. And I, I don't know whether this is a slightly random question, but the sodium radiation... Um accelerate certain types of cancer and therefore is the gender of the astronaut important or not important in terms of the risk factor? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, males and females have different risks. Um, I, ironically, uh, 
you know, most of us would think, okay, breast tissue, so females have that in addition to the ovaries. Uh, and that is true, but females also have a higher risk for lung cancer, um, at least statistically. And, and that may be due to the proximity of the breast tissue to the lungs. Uh, but they do have a slightly different quantitative risks. Um, and, and also that risk is different based on your age. Uh, the younger you are, uh, the more of a risk, which sounds counterintuitive too. Uh, but if you think about it, if I expose you at 25 years old uh, and you're gonna get a cancer in 20 years from uh, the cells uh, changing, now that's you know 45, you're getting a cancer. If you take somebody like you and I, uh, you know, no offense, Mark. We're, we're yeah, not no getting offense. any younger. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you expose somebody in their 50s, uh, you know, you and I might be face down from coronary disease or a stroke or something else or long gone from something else before that cancer arrives, uh, you know, at 75, 80, 85 years old. So, um, you know, age actually, uh, as you get older, actually helps uh, as far as your cancer risk from a long-term risk standpoint. So we, we do take into account the age of the astronaut and the sex of the astronaut. Um, we are looking at our radiation standards now. We're going off and, and looking at those. Uh, we think we have, may have built in too much conservatism uh, in our initial standards, and we're looking at uh, reevaluating as we've gotten data. Now that we have 20 years of data from the ISS, I mean, before we were having to extrapolate data from things like uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, uh, things were uh, unfortunately during wartime and, and uh, those aren't exactly the same types of radiation or dosages or, or shape of a curve. Um, than you know, a galactic cosmic radiation would be. And so now that we're getting more data um, from ISS and other places, we're taking those things in our, into account in our modeling, which may change our, our standards and threshold for uh, uh, the lifetime risk for an astronaut. And I think the training video produced by Matt Damon is a, is a good place to start in terms of what life on Mars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although we might, we might expand beyond potatoes, though. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, going back to one of my questions before, the, the look of the astronauts, and the, and the vehicle, but the, the look of the astronauts is, is very different to what we're used to seeing. Um, clearly, that's different design, but, but why such a different design? What's, what's so different about these spacesuits to the ones that have preceded them? Yeah, you know, um, that's the interesting part about working with commercial partners. Commercial partners have a brand and a marketing that they are working on, whereas, you know, NASA um, being a government agency, we work on functional requirements. You know, we, we, we don't have a requirement for something to look, quote unquote, sexy or, or something to look uh, sleek, you know. It, we don't, you know, we care if the space suit works uh, and saves your life, but we don't have those other um, interesting uh, influences coming from the outside. And so uh, that's another thing with with working with commercial partners is letting giving them license to develop things differently than we would have. And so uh, these definitely look a lot sleeker uh, than previous spacesuits, and uh, and still have the functionality and. Uh, to be able to save the astronaut's life and, and give uh, life-saving oxygen and pressure. Uh, and so those are the, you know, the things that they came up with with their spacesuit. But it's, it is pretty cool. Um, now, you know, I don't know if you saw their closeout crew, but their closeout crew was in all black. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm worried about those folks maybe getting a little warm in the heat of uh, Florida summers, but they, you know, they're, they're doing things differently than we do. But the reason that they've got that contrast in color versus the white suits that we use is if you're looking at a video to see what did that person adjust or what did they work on on a, on a spacesuit, uh, or, you know, it's easier to see black against what the white of the spacesuit to see where that person's arm or hand was and what they were adjusting. And so that helps them in their video as they're looking if there was an anomaly uh, to be able to assess, you know, what did what did our closeout crew look at? What did they touch? What did they, uh, what wrench did they turn? All of those things. And if I can impose on you, we've got some, 
some amazing questions from the uh, from the internet, and I wonder if you have time to answer a few of them. Yeah, please go ahead. Let me read them to you. So the first is from uh, Nikki McLeary, who is a um, MSc student on the uh, Exeter University Medical Program for Extreme Medicine. So her first question is: Exercise is crucial to the well-being of astronauts. Can we know more about the current study thinking in this area, and what and any pathways extreme sports scientists? Could, could, could become involved in research? Well, that's a great question, uh, Mark. The, yeah, exercise is extremely important. And in fact, we have uh, the astronauts doing about two hours of exercise, both aerobic and anaerobic on the space station right now. Uh, and what we've found is it's extraordinarily important in a multitude of things. One, uh, mental health uh, really helps the astronauts, uh, you know, probably feel better after we exercise, but especially uh, in space uh, with in your for your mental health, I think it really helps the astronauts a great deal. And we've gotten that feedback many times from many missions, uh, but also for the, uh, the, you know, the musculoskeletal system and especially the skeletal system. Um, Wolf's law, which states that bones grow according to the stresses placed upon them. Um, that exercise and the stress over the bones and, and the long bones is really important for uh, uh, the the bone mineral to lay down um, and to keep those bones strong and the density of those bones, but also to prevent that calcium from le then leaching out and going through the kidneys and causing a kidney stone. There are still a lot of opportunities for folks to get involved on the research side to uh, look at uh, exercise, and, and especially as we go to the moon and Mars, how much exercise is going to be needed when you have a partial gravity system? We've 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 got a great idea for microgravity on the space station, but when you get to the one six g of the moon, um, am I going to have to add some weight and countermeasures? Are they going to have to be, do squats or bench pressing on the moon to maintain their actual skeleton? Um, same thing for Mars. Uh, the nice part about the moon in relation to Mars is that any countermeasure that works in 1.6G is probably going to work in 1.3G of Mars. Uh, so uh, the moon is a good proving ground for that, uh, that particular countermeasure. Nikki's second question, which I think is a great one, how much research from the field of geriatric medicine is applied in the preparation for Mars? We've particular reference to post-war generational coping mechanisms and older populations dealing with long-term isolation and loneliness on a daily basis? Well, that's a, a, a great question, too. Um, we've learned not only from, uh, you know, whether it's geriatrics or other aspects of medicine, but also in uh, some of the uh, missions that you and I are familiar with, like uh, Shackelford's mission and, and other things where isolation of a crew uh, on a long journey, those long sea voyages uh, to the uh, through the ice, whether it was the Antarctic missions or, uh, or the Arctic uh, Trail, uh, looking for that passage in the Northwest, all of those things, uh, you know, really feed into our knowledge of... Uh, of human spaceflight. And one of the biggest things that we've found is that the crew need to be busy and occupied. That if if they're not busy and occupied, that, that that's one thing that uh, starts to deteriorate. And and even Shackelford found that in, in his, uh, or Shackleton rather. I, I, I keep saying Shackelford because we have a flight surgeon named Shackelford, but Shackleton's mission, uh, uh, you know, same thing. Uh, and Dr. Cook, uh, you know, when he has his diaries uh, for the exploration sea voyages as well, those were those are things where we, we see those same things come up. Um, so we are learning from those areas and taking those for exploration missions as well. And actually, and this is a slight aside, but the similarities between marine exploration and those long sea voyages is, you know, the parallels with space exploration are so, so you know, so obvious, and it's obviously even in the naming of the spaceships. Now that we've got a dragon, which is clearly nothing, no maritime links, are, are we seeing a new sort of naming paradigm now for the rockets? I I don't know. I you know I don't know if you noticed, but the crew kind of added a name to that dragon. Uh, you know that the Endeavor, uh, and so uh, uh, the current SpaceX crew kind of renamed their capsule the Endeavor. Uh, okay. So I, I, I think we, uh, um, 
we'll, we'll see what happens with the lexicon there. Uh, you know, I, I, I still think uh, between the, uh, the old sea voyages of exploration where you had lofty names of, of uh, Voyager and uh, Endeavor and, and all of those will still make it into the lexicon. I, I can't help but think a little Star Trek and Gene Roddenberry is going to find its way in there as well. No, uh, well, there's going to be more vehicles. They're going to need more names. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of looking forward to when Enterprise kind of sneaks its way uh, back into the lexicon as well. <laughs> um, anyway, going back to the questions, um, Daniel Grace um, has an interesting question about, um, there was an article on the ultimate telemedicine in terms of experts were helping to treat a national blood clot during a NASA mission. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that would be great to get some expansion on that. Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of things. Um, what's interesting is there is a shift in our openness on letting the public or other folks know what we were doing. Um, in the past, there's been lots of things that occurred in space that uh, we've treated medically that nobody else was aware of. We kept the privacy because the astronaut is a small, you know, they're a small cadre. Uh, we didn't want, uh, by divulging any information to uh, you know, betray the privacy of that astronaut and their medical privacy. Uh, now that we've gotten so many people that have flown and, and a large portion and a larger cadre of astronauts, um, and also with this uh, commercial venture, we need the commercial folks to know what it is that we have treated or seen in spaceflight. And so we've been much more open about things like seeing a clot in space or, or as you know, the, the optic nerve changes that we've seen in space and many of these medical conditions, which normally we would not have been very open about and we would have kept behind the, the cloak of secrecy. Um, and, you know, telemedicine has allowed us great insight to be able to garner um, expert opinion from around the world. Um, I literally can get, you know, if we have an eye exam being done, it's going to come down from the space station down to the flight surgeon console. And if they need a consult or if they need to let me be aware of it, they can send that, uh, that image uh, via what we call cryptic uh, through, you know, to me on my iPad. Uh, and we can get an opinion from the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, your folks around the world, uh, other clinics around the world, if necessary. Um, and uh, we can do that in a very short time period due to telemedicine. Um, and so it's really changed the paradigm as well uh, for how quickly we can get expert opinion Um how quickly we can all talk. I mean, this SpaceX mission, we had a surgeon in Hawthorne, California. We had a surgeon in Houston. We had the folks in the Launch Control Center in Florida. We had our international partners in Europe monitoring. Uh, we had uh, rescue forces all the way up in Milden Hall in case we had to abort off the coast of Ireland. I mean, this is really a huge global effort, and telemedicine is part of that. It's really kind of cool to see, though. But, it, but it's funny because I'll have clinics here in the U.S. that still can't talk to each other across the street. So mm -hmm. I, I don't have any empathy for them when I can get uh, a telemedicine packet down from my clinic that's traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, uh, 240 nautical miles above the Earth. We had a, a great question from Rohan Sant about the, the impact of um, space exploration on health. And I think we've covered that. But what medical benefits um, are we getting from astronauts being in space? And, this, and, you know, the amazing research that people like Kate Rubens are carrying out. What's on the, on the horizon for us in terms of, you know, medical advances, either technological or in terms of curative findings that, um, that you expect? Yeah, there, there's probably, um, there's a lot that, you know, I could speak just for hours just on that topic, but there are several areas. One, I would say there is a, a merger of technology and medicine that is coming at a larger speed than it has in the past. So let's take uh, stem cells and 3D printing, for example. Those sound like two separate different sciences, but it's not. And, uh, 
and you know we've been looking at uh, different technologies. Wake Forest University has been looking at uh, using stem cells and using living cell cultures in 3D printing to actually uh, print skin uh, on a burn victim, for example, but but skin that came from their own cell culture, not from a donor, so that the likelihood of rejection is not there. Um, being able to actually 3D print an organ like a kidney or uh, you know things that might be uh, reparative. You, you'd hate to be on Mars and think, wow, I sure wish we had X uh, or had packed Y. Um, and so being able to to take 3D printing and move it from, uh, you know, printing cute little plastic toys now to uh, a different scope of laying down cells uh, and medicine. That that is a game changer. Um, we've also been looking at uh, 3D printing of things like medications um, instead of you know, trying to think about every medicine I might need on Mars uh, and taking all of that weight and volume with me. Uh, what if I could just print a Cipro uh, or a Zithromax or, you know, some other medication, uh, you know, amoxicillin, uh, whatever it is. Um, you know, all of those are just uh, organic chemistry compounds uh, and a recipe. And, you know, could we feed that into a 3D printer if we've got the right recipe and, and print a, a, you know, a capsule or a tablet of medication just in time by just taking the chemical constituents with us uh, and then putting it together on Mars uh, using 3D printing. So the, those things are coming. They sound really futuristic, Mark, but if you see what they're doing in the lab, uh, it's pretty cool. Well, and also with your timeline, in order for them to be delivered on time, they've got to be ready in the next uh, three to four years. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's an, there's an amazing era of new space exploration opening, but also, uh, you know, an exciting field of technology, technology and medicine also opening up. It is. And, and there are things that you don't think would be related. It, it starts to give you um, a a broader idea of all the things and where they come into play. This this pandemic, as challenging as it's been, and as uh, you know, certainly challenging for the medical community and and the loss of life, um, it has caused us to also be innovative on our vaccine development and how. Um, instead of taking two two and a half years to get something through the uh, wickets, now speeding up that timeline and figuring out where we can accept risk, where we can't, looking at novel ways to do vaccines uh, with protein binding pro vaccines instead of just uh, uh, killed virus or live virus vaccines. Um, we are having to be innovative because of this. Uh, uh, that, that may translate also into some of the science and technology that we take in exploration uh, and vice versa. Some of the things that we discover in exploration on, on protein matrices uh, and microgravity feed into the vaccine world. It's a, it's truly a symbiotic relationship. It's, it's, yeah, it's amazing. And it's, it's almost like we're just beginning to lift the lid on some of the potentiality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Sandy Greenway about um, NASA originally discovered the benefits of red and near infrared uh, infra light, infrared light therapy in experiments in space in the early 90s. Since then, there have been hundreds of studies and trials proving its benefits. Um, do they have any red light therapy? Sorry, do you have any red light therapy on the ISS or any plans for on the moon? Um, I don't think we have any on the ISS right now. If you think about what our risk is on the ISS, uh, folks aren't running and falling down on the ISS. They're, they're floating from module to module. Uh, occasionally, they might you know, bump their head on a bulkhead, but we don't have a, a huge need for wound care and fibroblast uh, uh, you know, development and uh, wound healing on the space station. Um, but we have done experiments uh, looking at all of those things. Um, for when we get to exploration, when you're, you're, we're going to you know, be riding in a rover, you're going to be, you know, and no one's going to go slow. You know, they're going to want to put the pedal to the metal when they're going across the terrain uh, and walking and, and, and jogging through a, a plateau, all of those things, your, your risk for trauma, uh, you know, if we eventually are, uh, 
doing rock climbing uh, at, you know, in some area in, in Mars, your risk goes up. And so uh, more than likely, we will take technologies like that uh, to the moon and Mars, uh, especially for longer stays. The longer you stay, the more likelihood that something will occur uh, and your risk goes up uh, with time, as it does in anything. Um, and so uh, more than likely, we'll take those therapies uh, with us for exploration. But we have looked at those they, and, and their impact uh, to increase fibroblasts and collagen uh, for wound care. That was a great uh, question. Uh, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Sandy. Um, Indy Gregor asks about your career specific and what's the most interesting and challenging medical emergency that you've had to deal with on the space station during your personal career? Wow. Um, uh, you know, they're all challenging. The one where, you know, medically, I, I've not ever felt uh, fear or trepidation that we couldn't handle something on the space station. We've, we've, we've thought it through, even, even with the, the clot on board, we had uh, medications on board to treat uh, thromboemboli. I mean, so we we had forecasted uh, through our Monte Carlo analysis, through all of the the techniques that we used to try to forecast uh, what we would have on orbit. We we've been successful in that, and and we've never to date had a case where we thought, oh my gosh, we got to bring somebody home because uh, we we can't treat that. Um, and that that's probably a a big fact that most people miss. Every model out there says that we should have evacuated the space station for a medical reason at least once every six years. We're at year 20 right now and have had zero evacs. Um, that's a huge pertinent negative um, and a testament to the work uh, that our folks do in, in medicine at, and uh, not just at NASA, but with all of our international partners with ESA and JAXA and uh, Roscosmos. Um, and uh, the Canadian Space Agency, uh, all the work that all of those folks bring to the table have, have really helped allow us that, uh, that hallmark. The thing where I was most nervous probably in my career um, was when uh, Parmitano's uh, helmet started to fill with water. Uh, and we had a leak of water in a spacesuit. And, and the fear that, that uh, Luca might uh, aspirate or you know, that we might you know, have our, an astronaut drown in, in, in space. Um, you know, that impacted me a great deal. We, fortunately, it did not happen. We got them in. We had procedures in mission control and, and uh, executed those emergency procedures and got them in, got the helmet off, and, and he was fine. Um, but those things worry me a great deal. And, you know, it's... And it's always the things, Mark, that, that you don't plan on. It, you know, we can forecast, do Monte Carlo analysis till the cows come home. It's always the what I call the black swan or, or you know, that Nicholas Taleb's uh, uh, book. Uh, that's the one that I worry about is this. It's the unknown unknowns that they come, come in, in and bite you. Uh, this or Nassim Taleb, rather, uh, that I worry about. So. JD, you, you've, we, we've had you on the line now for almost an hour, and I know you've got an awful lot to do. So um, we're going to sign off. But I do want to thank you so much for spending the time and answering so many questions from so many great, great questions from the Internet. What's, um, what's in store for you over the uh, in the near future now? Well, we've, we're, uh, we're still paying attention, obviously, to the mission in front of us, which is the International Space Station mission that's going on right now with our crew on board, uh, as well as the SpaceX crew on board. Uh, we will work on uh, the landing operations for that SpaceX capsule um, and, and do what we call a launch readiness review to make sure we have everything uh, and all the risks addressed and all the rescue forces and everything uh, lined up for that. Um, and then uh, we'll get ready to launch the second SpaceX uh, crew mission, uh, which we'll call Crew-1. Uh, this one is, is considered a test flight. This next one considered more the Crew-1 mission. Um, and uh, that'll be at the, uh, you know, close to the end of summer in the uh, you know, August timeframe, August, September timeframe. 
Um, we're also simultaneously working on the Boeing commercial space flight mission uh, to get their their second uh, vehicle uh, aloft this time with crew, uh, you know, and, and to you know, get those. Whether we'll do another test mission in between there, yeah, I think we're working on that uh, before we launch crew. Uh, so we're working with Boeing there, working very quickly on the lander for for Moon. Um, we've down selected to three vendors, uh, working on those uh, Artemis lander systems, and uh, uh, we're we're hot and heavy working on our requirements and standards for that vehicle right now. It's it's really you know it's literally feeling like it's right in front of us, Mark. It's uh, it's no longer a whiteboard effort. I mean we're we're you know, getting close to doing down selects for metal, you know, people to go bend metal on things. And that's, uh, that's, that's when, you know, it's real once, you know, when you start seeing a skeleton of a vehicle, uh, up here, um, and simultaneously working on the con ops, uh, for the Mars missions and, uh, what we would need, how long they would be, uh, you know, how we would land, what vehicle uh, would it look like, uh, and working on the gateway missions simultaneously. Um, um, and, you know, also working COVID uh, to make sure that we can get our, uh, our uh, NASA employees and the contractors back to centers uh, safely, uh, but in a staged and methodical way so that we don't uh, endanger our employees while we still have hotspots. So uh, just a few things going on. <laughs> just a few. It's an amazing crossroads, isn't it? And thank you for sharing your, your enthusiasm, but also your, your amazing insights into what the future might hold. Now, it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, to, to, to spend so much time with you. And thank you for giving us and the audience the, the, your time today. Well, Mark, you know, I thank you for what you're doing with World Extreme Medicine because, you know, it, it is taking uh, the medicines at the extreme in multiple different environments. And those lessons learned, uh, whether they be in a jungle, or undersea, uh, on the ice or wherever, uh, those come back into uh, exploration and, and you know, the extreme medicine of moving humankind to other planets. And so uh, we're learning from you too, bud. So I, I appreciate the invites and uh, I'm looking forward to breaking bread with you again in, in uh, Scotland uh, when this is all over. Well, we know that we you're hankering for your days in the helicopter, so hopefully we can get you out into the field of us as well. That would be amazing. That would I would be- like that. I still have my uh, I still have my helmet. I'll bring my helmet. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Definitely. JD, thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Griffin, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed.